The year 1993 saw Purdue building for the future, both in terms of physical structures and academic achievements. The West Lafayette campus gained two new buildings, the Liberal Arts and Education Building and Hillenbrand Residence Hall. The $28.5 million Liberal Arts and Education Building houses the School of Education and several departments in the School of Liberal Arts. The building has 35 classrooms and features a seventh floor conference room with a panoramic view. That view includes the new Founders Park just to the south. The focal point of this new student gathering area is the refurbished Loeb Fountain, which once stood in front of Hubdy Hall. For the first time in 23 years, Purdue opened a new residence hall. Hillenbrand Hall opened its doors in August to 800 male and female students. With air-conditioned rooms and semi-private bathrooms, this $36 million facility became an instant hit with students. Among those at the September dedication were members of the Hillenbrand family, which supplied two former members of the Purdue Board of Trustees. John and William Hillenbrand served 42 years on our Board of Trustees. So it wasn't really very difficult when our committee sat down to determine whom to honor with this spectacular facility. With the completion of Hillenbrand, it was time to say goodbye to Fowler Courts. This 1950s prefabricated housing complex had outlived its usefulness. The buildings were raised to make room for a parking lot. Fowler House is being remodeled into a daycare facility and kindergarten operated by the Department of Child Development and Family Studies. Construction began on a major addition to Lynn Hall, home of the School of Veterinary Medicine. A menagerie of animals took part in the spring groundbreaking, including a team of oxen. This is the first renovation since the building opened in 1959. This new building will provide state-of-the-art educational facilities of modern research laboratories, contemporary and humane animal care and housing facilities. It will provide outstanding hospital facilities for both large and small animals so that we can deliver the very best of veterinary care. Finally, it will provide sufficient office space to enable all of our faculty and staff to be under one roof. The Molenkoff Athletic Center became the site of a new sign welcoming people to the north end of campus. Purdue reached out to the state, nation, and world through its research and programs. For example, the Reading Recovery Program in the School of Education identified Hoosier first graders who were struggling with reading and brought them up to the level of their classmates through intensive one-on-one -on -one instruction. I think one of the important things is that we do an early intervention before children have a chance to fail. So in the Reading Recovery Program, they're being successful every day in reading and writing. The School of Consumer and Family Sciences and the so Purdue Extension Service reached out to, to pregnant teenagers through the Have a Healthy Baby program. If you smoke, if you don't gain enough weight, you can have a baby that's born too soon or too small. Extension specialists met with pregnant girls at Indiana high schools and advised them on prenatal nutrition and healthy lifestyle choices. This has dramatically reduced the number of low birth weight babies from a state average of nearly 7% to about 2.5%. Every time a baby is born less than five and a half pounds, that baby goes into intensive care. Intensive care nurseries for babies are one to two thousand dollars a day, many times more. We have saved the state of Indiana about four million dollars. Well, I just don't have a guess on what kind of bone that is. Another off-campus enterprise saw sociology and anthropology professor Chris Helmkamp lead a team of students on an archaeological dig at Lake Freeman near Monticello. The group recovered human skeletons and artifacts dating back to the 5th century. Work was done while the lake was drained to allow the local power company to fix a nearby dam. So we're over the goal, the financial goal. Vision 21, Purdue's fundraising campaign to prepare for the 21st century, surpassed a major milestone in November. The campaign won over $250 million and will continue soliciting contributions until the victory celebration in October 1994. Corporations, foundations, and individuals donated funds. One gift of $2 million came from Indianapolis cable television executive James Ackerman and his wife. The money will be used to create the James Ackerman Center for Democratic Citizenship in the School of Education. If we can influence a hundred or more young students in our elementary schools to become more aware of how our republic should act as a democracy, then what we propose and gifted will be well spent. But this is just the beginning, because the 21st century is going to require of all of us in higher education a constant effort of uh, co contribution of various kinds, and we want to make sure that our scholarship and fellowship programs look like those of the distinguished private universities 
who are our peers. Bearing and Vice President for Development Chuck Wise were joined by the Varsity Glee Club on several trips, including this one in January to the West Coast. The trip included a Glee Club performance at the Crystal Cathedral, which was broadcast nationally. And there was light, the light. And there was light, and there was light. Love of classical music helped the class of 1942 raise $200,000 toward the creation of a 5,000-watt FM outlet for campus radio station WBAA. In February, WBAA-FM signed on the air with classical music in stereo. January saw the establishment of the Helen Bass Williams Scholarship for African-American students. The scholarship is named after a civil rights pioneer at Purdue. It brings inspiration to our quest for to acknowledge our diversity as a nation and speaks to the talents and gifts that each of us share regardless of ethnicity, gender, and personal ability. In September, Ameritech created a temporary super school classroom in the School of Education to show how telecommunications can reach beyond the walls of traditional classrooms. This Boeing 727, piloted by Purdue alumnus Neil Armstrong for its final flight from Indianapolis, became a permanent fixture at the Purdue airport and a valuable learning tool for aviation technology students. After receiving a special Purdue paint job, the jet was donated by United Airlines. Armstrong, the first man on the moon, said this gift would help Purdue stay at the forefront of aeronautical education and research. This is a majestic aircraft, and now it's a senior citizen. And it's particularly appropriate that its days be spent nobly, where it can continue to serve. The School of Technology also received another major gift. Several companies donated $2 million worth of equipment to the Computer Integrated Manufacturing Technology Lab in Kanoi Hall. The lab simulates a totally automated factory. Most of you in industry today are asking for people that can work on a team, work on a total system of manufacturing, and that's what the Computer Integrated Manufacturing Technology pr Program does. That's what this laboratory does for us in the School of Technology in Purdue University. The new Boilermaker Special 5 was unveiled in September, again thanks to a multitude of corporate gifts. The updated Purdue mascot was designed to resemble the original Boilermaker Special of 1940. The special is operated by the Reamer Club, whose members sang at the dedication. A different type of music took place on Memorial Mall in October. A Native American group, the Yellow River Singers and Dancers, led students in a ceremony celebrating the earth. This event was part of Wilderness Week, sponsored by the Purdue Student Government. The 36th running of the Purdue Grand Prix was won by independent entry Ian Smith of Frankfort, Indiana. Purdue's chapter of the Society of Automotive Engineers competed in a national formula-style racing car competition. Purdue finished sixth in the show and design category. A messier event took place in the spring when students got down and dirty playing mud volleyball. In April, students in the Society of Civil Engineers from several Midwestern universities showed that cement can float and concrete can fly. Student-made cement canoes, which weighed between 100 and 500 pounds, raced in the waters of Lake Schaefer near Monticello. Concrete frisbees were also tossed. In the fall, students took part in activities like jousting and bungee cord running as part of a sports fest sponsored by Sports Illustrated and local merchants.
controlling enzymes is really a fundamental key of life. Learning is the lifeblood of Purdue. The success of that learning process depends on excellent teachers. One of those is Martha Chiskin, Associate Professor of Biological Sciences and Assistant Dean of the School of Science. She was named the Indiana Professor of the Year by the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education. It's an honor her former students say is well deserved. I ended up in this big course where there were hundreds of students. Martha was the professor and it was amazing to me how she reached out to the students and especially even students like me that felt a little lost in the university environment. Improving teaching, especially by graduate students, was the topic for a fall workshop that featured former U.S. Commissioner of Education Ernest Boyer. And I think that will really lead to a climate of renewal around teaching and learning at this really remarkable institution. The graduate student experience was the focus of a fall visit by some 60 students from historically black institutions. This yearly program encourages HBI students to consider advanced studies at Purdue. In the past six years, African-American enrollment in Purdue's graduate school has jumped 130 percent. Former HBI student Bornadotta Evans is seeking her doctorate in biochemistry at Purdue. The big challenge is to go to graduate school and to go back and teach at a higher institution because we really need the teachers out there, especially African-American teachers, because even at the historically black institutions, most of our professors are white. Myra Mason, who was named Purdue's first director of diversity and multicultural affairs in 1993, spoke to the visiting HBI students. We want strong, smart, ambitious young people to lead this country to the greatness that it can achieve. So I want some of them to be Purdue graduates. Other 1993 administrative changes included a new vice president for physical facilities. Wayne Chenis was previously the director of utilities. He replaced Ken Burns, now vice president for business services and assistant treasurer. Howard Lyon moved to vice president for management information and long-range budget planning. Well, it sounds like, a Purdue uh, student talking with her father doesn't sound unusual, but it turned into a major event when the father happened to be talking from outer space. Junior Carolyn Blaha spoke with her father, John, as he orbited the Earth in the shuttle Columbia. Hi, Daddy. How you doing? Over. Carolyn, I'm doing absolutely wonderful. We're having so much fun up here. We've got a lot of work done in the past 11 days. Beautiful life science research that we'll come and tell you about when we get back. Over. <laughs> that sounds great, Dad. It really does. The shortwave radio connection was made possible by biology professor David Filmer, who used the amateur radio equipment in his basement. Two other Purdue astronauts returned to campus in the fall. Jerry Ross brought back items he flew on the shuttle and presented them to both the Alumni Association and Tomahawk Honorary. And Janice Voss, Purdue's first female graduate to fly in space, made a similar presentation to the athletic department. The university gained an official anthem in January when the Board of Trustees adopted the Purdue hymn as the alma mater. The song was written in 1943. In front of the trustees, Purdue Musical Organization's director Brian Breed led members from the Varsity Glee Club in its first official singing. Glee Club also celebrated its 100th year of singing with a centennial concert in April in the Elliott Hall of Music.
Music was also heard on the gridiron as the Purdue All-American Marching Band entertained fans. In the fall, the band welcomed new Silver Twins, Kelly Byer, a sophomore from Chesterton, Indiana, and Ann Berman, a junior from Dublin, Ohio. 8,000 students graduated from Purdue in 1993. Most degrees were awarded during four ceremonies in May. Graduates automatically became members of the Purdue Alumni Association. The Alumni Association sponsored a variety of on-campus events, including senior send-off on the steps of Hubby Hall, at which seniors got their final grades. The Alumni Association initiated its first annual Purdue Alumnus Magazine tailgate recipe contest. Alumni submitted favorite recipes for snacks, sandwiches, and desserts. The Department of Restaurant, Hotel, Institutional, and Tourism Management prepared the 18 finalists for blind tasting by 30 judges. The recipes were a hit, luring some judges back for seconds and thirds. The Purdue Student Alumni Association handed out free t-shirts as part of a fall promotion aimed at increasing membership. The Alumni Association honored three Purdue staff members with special Boilermaker Awards at halftime of a football game. The awards, which honor recipients for their work with students, went to Steve Akers, Associate Executive Dean of Students, Dr. Bill Combs, Purdue's longtime athletic team physician, and Martha Fletcher, Assistant Director of Field Experiences in the School of Education. The Alumni Association sponsors many events during gala weekend in April, including what turned out to be the largest ever class parade to John Purdue's grave. In the fall, the Alumni Association sponsored its annual homecoming banquet, which was highlighted by comments from President Beering. One of the characteristics of a great university is a constant tension between the old and the new. We protect and treasure our traditions, but we can never rest upon our laurels. If we fail to explore new ideas and seek new challenges, we will lose the edge that makes us a world-class institution. Also featured at the banquet was 1993 homecoming queen Holly Croxall, an elementary education major from Elkhart, Indiana. She was crowned at halftime of the homecoming game. Prior to the game, the Alumni Association, for the first time, sponsored a tent with live music outside ross Aide Stadium. The 25th anniversary football team returned for homecoming, while the 50th anniversary team, which was the last unbeaten team in Purdue history, returned for the final home game against Michigan State. Speaking of football, the Boilermakers paid the price for playing the nation's toughest schedule with the Big Ten's youngest team, but outstanding individual efforts were turned in. Senior cornerback Jimmy Young, who tied the Purdue record for most career interceptions, was named first team all Big Ten. Fullback Mike Allstott scored 14 touchdowns as he became the first sophomore in almost 50 years to be named Purdue's most valuable player. The Purdue baseball team finished third, making the Big Ten playoffs for the first time in six years. Five players on the squad were drafted by major league teams, including speedy outfielder Jermaine Allensworth and slugging first baseman Mike Biltmeyer. In volleyball, senior Carrie Burvis was named first team all Big Ten as she led the team in kills. Perhaps no individual Purdue athlete received as much attention as sophomore basketball sensation Glenn Robinson. In his first season as a Boilermaker, Robinson made several All-American teams and led Purdue to the NCAA tournament. The women's basketball team stumbled slightly in 1992-93, but with the help of a talented group of freshmen appeared ready to rebound. The men's and women's basketball teams joined forces for a December doubleheader in Indianapolis. Not only did both teams win, but fans got a chance to shoot baskets and enjoy the boiler atmosphere at a pregame block party outside Market Square Arena. So this event and these events are much broader than basketball. We're trying to reconnect all of Purdue, all of the university with the resources that are here in this town. A new women's intercollegiate sport got off the ground in 1993. New coach Carol Bruggeman held tryouts in the fall for the first Purdue softball team. Softball season begins in the spring of 1994. It's definitely a building process. Um, coming from a couple Big Ten championship teams, I think we know what it takes to get there, but it's going to take us a few years. We need to be patient. Some past and present Purdue coaches and athletes were honored in 1993. 
Senior Todd Messer finished first in a cross-country meet that preceded the ceremony to name the newly refurbished outdoor track facility after Dave Rankin, the head track coach from 1946 to 1981. Many former basketball players and coaches returned to campus in the fall for the first basketball family reunion. After a day on the golf course, they gathered for a banquet. New athletic director Morgan Burke welcomed them. There is a tremendous, I think, desire and thirst to come back and be part of the, uh, the athletic organization to be able to reminisce and share. The banquet also honored longtime assistant coach and administrator Bob King and featured a talk by Purdue graduate and former UCLA coaching legend John Wooden. 1932 was the most memorable year for me in many ways. I graduated from Purdue. We had won the national championship. I received the Big Ten medal for scholarship in athletics and that was more important to me than the other things. Associate Athletic Director and longtime Chicago Cubs fan Dale Samuels got a surprise birthday gift when his family arranged for him to throw out the first pitch at a Wrigley Field game. With more than 35,000 students on the West Lafayette campus and 65,000 system-wide, Purdue continues to build for the future. Its faculty, alumni, facilities, and traditions ensure a strong foundation on which to build for decades to come.